Alrighty, one of my favorite things is astronomy. The whole James Webb thing, telescope thing has been amazing for me. And my favorite thing of all is seeing photos of the Earth from space. And if you're a flat earther, uh, save it. <laughs> I've been to, through so many science classes, you can't convince me it's not a globe. Anyway, that's beside the point. So I want to recreate this in a vase vessel thing. And it's presented some challenges. Um, I think this is the first time I'm going to have to do two pours on purpose. This is going to be a learning experience. No way around it, but it's going to be fun. And who doesn't want a ridiculous challenge that you can only pull off half of, right? That's kind of my mantra. All right, let's see what we can do. I think I mentioned before that um, we bought this bit of property in um, near Salt Lake City in Utah and had a bunch of trees in it, lots of trees. The place had kind of been abandoned for a few years and then it had a bunch of rental renters in it that didn't really take care of the place. And when we took over and bought the thing, uh, there was a huge willow tree that was mostly dead bunch of scrub oak anyway I chopped them all up with some help from a professional company because this willow tree was like four or five feet across big big tree threw them in a in our wood pile and left them there to rot maybe to burn one day yeah I didn't really have plans I wasn't really a woodworker at all and here I am what like eight eight years later fishing them out of the wood pile they're cured, they've cracked, <laughs> and they are what they are. So I'm just kind of using what I've got. Um, I didn't have the luxury of prepping the ends and pre preventing the cracking and all that, but turns out the way I like to make things doesn't really matter. Um, I kind of like using cracked old wood. It's a fairly realistic representation of what you typically find out there. Um, that being said, I do appreciate woodworkers that um, take the time to make a piece of art or a bowl or whatever out of a perfect piece of wood and without any blemish. I think there's a real skill to that too. Uh, but that's why you see me using really crummy looking wood because I, that's what I've got, but also that suits what I'm doing. You'll notice as I go along that I had a much bigger, longer log than wide, meaning if I was going for a globe, I was going to waste a lot of wood. And I knew that going in, but I also knew that I needed to do two different resin pores to create the ocean and then the cloudy layer of the globe. And I needed uh, connecting uh, some ridges where I could connect my plastic sheeting to create the... A temporary mold for the for the uh, resin to limit the amount of resin waste and so that's why I left quite a bit of wood on there so I could have plenty of room to work plenty of places I could attach and then destroy later If you're wondering what art for OUR is, um, a couple of us who volunteered for Operation Underground Railroad, this is a, a group that goes around the world trying to save kids from sex trafficking rings and, and such. Um, we decided to start a website that would support artists who would like to support Operation Underground Railroad. So if you go there now, we've got about, I think we finally cracked that 100 artist mark, which blows my mind. Um, and we've got artists donating everything, any form of art. Some I, I had, hadn't even heard of before we started this. I have donated things. Um, not all professionals, some amateur. I put myself in that category. Um, 
but everybody's heart's in the right place. And uh, as Christmas is approaching, um, consider jumping on that website and grabbing something for friends and family. Um, anywhere from 50 to 100% of the proceeds go to Operation Underground Railroad. And uh, I can't think of a better cause uh, to try to save kids from modern day slavery around the world. I think we finally cracked the $85,000 mark we've raised so far in the last year and a half or so. Love to hit a hundred thousand by the end of the year, but we'll see if we get there. It's gonna be close. I like this willow wood. It also has a nice grain to it. It's got a nice look, nice color, a nice warm color to it. One of the bigger challenges for this project was getting a map that wasn't distorted that fit my globe <laughs> the size it was a bigger challenge than you think one of the frustrating things is i thought this map looked pretty good you know sometimes it's distorted because it's hard to take a globe and put it turn it into a map in the first place so we're going reverse trying to put a map on a globe and the thing that frustrates me is that map looked pretty good. <laughs> somehow, somehow between uh, cutting it out, tr tracing it, and cutting the wood, some uh, some things got pretty distorted. I think I owe a personal apology to anybody on the Arabian Peninsula. I think I cut you out mm -hmm. completely somehow. Sorry about that. Anyway, I kind of butchered some of your country, so sorry about that. Nothing personal. I'm not sure what happened to Northern Europe, but it uh, turned into a long, skinny thing. This is harder than it looks. <laughs> First attempt, I'm actually pretty, pretty happy with it in the end. Could have slowed down and taken more time on it for sure, but... Uh, one thing that was on my mind this whole time was I, I really wanted to show the swirling clouds. That's my favorite part of a photo from space of the Earth. And unfortunately, I didn't quite capture that as, as well as I wanted. Um, but because that was my goal, I wasn't, too, I wasn't too focused on making the continents perfect because I didn't think you'd see them anyway. So I just wanted some pretty good detail, but not perfect. And... Uh, the clouds didn't show up as as detailed as I wanted or as dense. Um, so anyway, you live and you learn. I think I say that every project. Definitely will be doing this again. This was quite a learning process. And the end result is one of my favorite projects so far. So. A big thank you to Graph uh, for donating some carving discs. Um, they sent some over for me to use. I believe they're from Lithuania, which is pretty cool. Uh, love their carving discs. I've yet to find a better t instrument or tool for uh, roughing out uh, large amounts of wood where a chainsaw would be too much. And... It's, it's too much for a, like a Dremel or one of those little handheld rotary carving tools. So big fan of these graph carving discs.
You'll notice I drilled a bunch of holes initially. Uh, that, that's my depth gauge. Um, I drilled them all a very specific depth. Um, so that as I was carving with the disc, especially out in the middle of these bigger ocean areas, I would know that I would hit the right depth and wasn't just winging it. I have a what's called a roto zip. It's like a Dremel on steroids, super powerful. They have these multi-purpose tips uh, that are great for wood. And uh, for this project especially, it was great for um, carving out some of the smaller details. I tell you what's impossible. Canada. Canada is impossible. What the heck, my Canadians? There's about a gajillion lakes up there. <laughs> I, I did not do you justice. Sorry about that. Um, again, I was really hoping to cover everything up with really awesome swirly clouds and uh, I think I got about 30% of that, what I wanted on that. So anyway, I'm sure I'm going to hear a lot of belly aching about what the heck did you do to my country? <laughs> eh, don't take it too personal. Quick shout out to one of our awesome sponsors. It's Trumi, T-R-O-O-M-I. They are a smartphone for kids. <clears throat> My brother started this company in, uh, with the worry that when a kid has access to the internet and connection to strangers that they get, prom they get um, taken advantage of quite a lot. That's, that's a lot of how a lot of how, how a lot of kids get stuck in sex torsion type scenarios and uh it's just a lot of adult things that kids don't need to be seeing you know and so i applaud him for starting that and we've partnered together and anytime you sign up and use our code in the video description at trumi um you get 30 i'm um, sorry 30 bucks off your subscription and we donate 50 bucks to operation underground railroad so you know anyone who's got teenagers looking for a smartphone that's not too accessible to the entire world? It's a great place to go. I find that they're much better than those Gab phones. We tried those once with our kids, but had much better success. So this round of painting was kind of a test run. I knew I was going to be sanding this off anyway, but I just wanted to see what colors look good and what I should be doing and thinking about. So I've mentioned before, uh, one of the biggest challenges with doing these big pours, um, it's impossible to find bowls and vases and different vessels to match the shape of the bowl I'm making every time because I make a different shape every time. So I have a huge collection of bowls from a secondhand store <laughs> that I'm never going to use because I finally figured out how to do this uh, temporary mold. Um, this is some plastic sheeting from Home Depot. It doesn't really have much of a name. This one's, it was called uh, electric paneling covering, um, but it's semi-rigid uh, plastic sheeting that you can cut up, just kind of generic stuff. And by cutting in strips and super gluing it on each end, it creates a nice mold, so I'm not wasting too much resin when I put it in the pressure pot. Um, I've learned to leave one um, section loose so that when I pour the resin, it can actually get into my mold. I, I've gotten too good at making these molds. I had one that was almost airtight, the, the chest one I did. And so there were some big, huge bubbles in there. So leave one open so the resin can easily get down in there. I like to triple bag these because man, all you need is one leak and you will ruin your pressure pot. Uh, one of my, one of my videos shows that in every painstaking detail. <laughs> Uh, thank you to whoever suggested rice, dry rice. It's great. I used to use sand. It was too uh, dusty. Um, stuff's much more lightweight, so I can actually transfer this inner liner pot from from vacuum chamber to pressure pot without a problem. 
and it doesn't rot because uh, here in Utah it is super dry and doesn't seem to go bad at all. For my kind of projects where it's big 3D object where there's a million places to trap bubbles, um, I like to do vacuum chamber and a pressure pot. I also like to use this long deep pour, uh, long setting deep pour resin uh, by Total Boat. It's called Fathom. Uh, F A T H O M. It's great stuff. You can go, they say up to three inches. I've done four or five if you can keep the temperature down. Uh, but it's great stuff. Uh, works like a charm. Temperature control is just huge. You've got to keep this when you're doing this much resin at a time, you got to keep it down well below, let's say 60 degrees, maybe the low 50s. I wanted this project to be somewhat transparent, but dense enough to still get that ocean fill. So I keep pouring it into this little cup at about the depth of the thickness I wanted my walls to be in the end to make sure that I got that fill, but it wasn't so dense that I couldn't see through it. You know what I'm saying? So, and I did three different colors of blue. I wanted to see some uh, ocean currents, you know, kind of the different variations you can see in the ocean, which worked out pretty good, I thought. This is a 10 gallon vacuum chamber. Uh, one of the reasons for this is it helps, well, because the wood is in the resin, it helps evacuate the air bubbles that are within the wood and it helps the resin set very deep into the wood which uh, helps it bind very well and it also gets rid of these little these little dang pockets in the wood <clears throat> that will leave trailing bubbles of of air as it as the resin sets so this is a really good way to get rid of that problem and that's that's pretty much solved that issue and then I like to put it in the pressure pot where it will cure for a number of days. And that squeezes any remaining micro bubbles you got from mixing or whatever um, down to invisible. And, and that usually solves the issue. So those are the temperatures I have been working with. I've got this little chest freezer. It gets a little too cold in there. And so I put a little fan on the top to circulate the air so the bottom doesn't freeze. Um, and I think I've figured this thing out. I think I finally got to the point where I can do these big old thick pours. I'm not getting bubbles. Um, it's not overheating and cracking. And I think I've got a good system now. The one, one final wrinkle I need to figure out is that on occasion I'll get a little tiny bubble trapped on the underside of some object I put in the resin. I'm not sure how to solve that issue. Maybe, uh, because the, the bubble could have risen at any point, right? But maybe jostling around, shaking it at different stages would have helped. But kind of hard to do when you get it packed in all this rice and, and everything. But it's those aren't bad. You can barely see them, especially in this very complex project. Somebody gave me the idea to wrap the tenon in tuck tape, and that worked out really well. Helps if you end up spilling some resin on it or it's too deep. Um, that really makes a difference in preserving the tenon, which is absolutely critical. If you have to reshape your tenon or recenter it, just a little bit on one side translates into an inch or two on the other side, and you lose your subject. Uh, been down that road a million times, so 
however you center the project, you have to get back to that so that it's perfect. And so preserving the tenon is, is a very important. I don't mind in the first stage of turning big resin projects, chipping away at it like that. I have learned though to stop early on, otherwise you could get some deep cracks because of that chipping, but it, it speeds it along. If you don't do that, you'll be streaming off ribbons of, of resin until you die. <laughs> so once I get it pretty much roughed out, uh, I'll turn into a, I'll turn to a negative rake, a neg negative angle uh, carbide tip, which will help smooth it down quickly and gets what I want. Just remember that um, your subscription, your turning on the notifications and uh, watching these videos helps me raise money for Operation Underground Railroad. I, I donate 100% of what I earn and generate to them. So it's a good cause. Love to have your support. We are about to hit 30,000 subscribers, and that, I cannot believe that. That's just amazing. So thank you for supporting me with my crazy art projects and my my reasoning for doing it, not only because I love art to make, I love creating, but uh, I love doing something for these kids that are in trouble. Initially, I was going to have a bit of a stand on the bottom, a pedestal for it to sit on, and then a kind of a lip at the top, like a vase. And I unfortunately chipped it so badly that it broke off. And honestly, in the end, I'm glad that all I ended up with is a little pedestal on the bottom and no lip on top. It just really wasn't what I was going for. It was too fancy, you know? No, uh, I just wanted a simple globe look. And so I'm not actually sad that didn't work out, but you wonder why I worked so hard on the end of it for a while there, and that's that's what I was thinking. <laughs> As far as making it a perfect sphere, there are a lot of different techniques for that. And I decided on this one to employ the ancient technique of wing it. <laughs> I just, I don't know. I knew I was going to be changing the shape of it and trying different things. So I just decided to eyeball it. And I think it turned out pretty well. When I look at it now, I don't look at it and go, oh, dang, it's off center, you know. But. I did get close to losing my outer layer once I made it. If you watch really carefully, I, I get really thin on one side, but it worked out pretty well.
I'm not going to lie, this was a big undertaking. I think the hardest thing was I've essentially made two bowls in one. Uh, this first layer had to be sanded to perfection, otherwise you'd see the imperfections through the clear layer I did later. Uh, so I had to get a perfect finish twice. And I spare you here, two things happened. So I ended up finishing this thing like three times. <laughs> One of them was, um, despite having a, a steady rest on here and everything, it popped off and broke my tendon at one point. It was a little too aggressive and I had to resand it just because it gouged it. And then um, I think I put my multi-rest, the steady rest on too tightly and ran it too fast because the wheels, which typically don't leave a mark, one of them melted. <laughs> you, you watch closely, it leaves a ring of melted plastic in there. and I just about cried when that happened because I had to sand it all down again, which takes a while. The full sanding process takes at least an hour or two. <clears throat> when you're doing, dealing with clear resin, you want it perfectly smooth. I mean, it's... It takes a good little while, so anyway. I really liked how the ocean turned out. This is one thing resin suited perfectly for is water or an ocean look. Clouds are tricky. I tried a bunch of different things. I um, ordered some uh, angel clay. I'd seen people make really cool clouds and resin with that, but the stuff was so dense and I couldn't get it to, I couldn't feather it out like I wanted to at this scale. It's great for little clouds, but not big ones that you might want to see through a little bit. And maybe I just need to learn how to manipulate it better. But so I ditched that plan. I, I tried some, I was making this around Halloween, so. Tried some fake cobweb stuff, and it, that looked manufactured. So I ended up with cotton balls, stretching them out. And the irony here is I put a ton on there, and I thought, man, it doesn't look good. It doesn't look like I wanted. It's going to look like a three-year-old did it. And then when I put it through the next pouring of resin, which was just clear resin, the stuff about disappeared. <laughs> Perhaps... I should have done a test run first to see what it would do, but I don't have time for that. I'm going to just march forward. So instead of getting a lovely big swirly clouds, um, you get wispy clouds, which you can barely see, which is fine. It turned out it's got its own character to it for sure. But uh, I went from, I thought I did way too much and looking like crap to, uh, to way too little. I could have done far more. And I actually like how it looks in the clear resin, how it kind of made it a little more translucent. Um, so if I attempt this again, I'm going to put a ton on there and hopefully get that Mother Earth look that's so famous. It's... um. One thing to put a big project like this in a big bucket and waste three gallons of resin. And it's quite another thing to create a custom mold every time to save resin and to keep the walls from getting so thick that they overheat when they set and, and crack and all that. Um, so this uh, custom molding approach has worked well. The trick is finding plastic that's rigid enough that it can hold up against the the weight of the resin inside and the sand or rice or whatever you, you use on the outside uh, but still flexible enough to actually use so I like this stuff I keep looking for something new but that's kind of the idea one little thing I've learned the hard way is when I put my resin in a pressure pot it's gonna settle it uh, when you compress all the little tiny air bubbles in the resin you lose volume and so I've learned to put it in there for an hour or two and then keep a little resin on the side to top it off I've had some really sad moments where I realized that the top third of my project was exposed and without resin um, but if you top it off after an hour or two you're good it usually doesn't settle much after that so 
lessons I've learned the hard way. Well, in the end, um, it's one of my favorite projects. It was a ton of work, but uh, I don't really keep track of the hours when I work it in the shop. Put the kids to bed. If I still have energy, go out and work in the shop and uh, make something cool. That's good for the soul, I think. Um, so thank you for your support. Always appreciated. I'll uh, leave you with a Merry Christmas. Thanksgiving's coming up here in the United States. Happy Hanukkah, Kwanzaa, whatever it is you do. Um, and I will see you on the next project. So thank you so much for your support, and have a great one. Take care.